Richard Glossop has been sitting on death row for 24 years. He's scheduled for execution for the fourth time this coming September. But could he really be innocent? Hello, my name is Janine, and I'm here to give you the facts and to show you the contradictions related to the interrogations between two convicted killers. But I want you to give me your own opinions in the comments below. Before we get into it, please hit the subscribe button as you don't want to miss any more possible updates in this case. With that being said, welcome to Now You Know. Before we get into everything, I want to inform you that in this video, we will be reviewing only the initial interrogations between the two men because the defense of Richard claims the conviction was based solely on the word of Justin Sneed. Now, this story aired on the Dr. Phil show six years ago. You can find clips of it on YouTube. When I watched them, I was shocked. An innocent man was on death row. My mind was made up, and then I started researching things. It was Richard's own words that put me on the fence. Now I don't know who to believe. Let me show you what I found. My sources to the transcripts will be in the description box if you'd like to read them in their entirety for yourself. I'll start with a brief description of the four main people we're going to be focusing on. First, the victim, Barry Van Treese. He was a loving, devoted husband and father, as well as a successful businessman. He owned a motel chain named the Best Budget Inn. By all accounts, he seemed to have been a very good man, and he certainly did not deserve what had happened to him. Now, the convicted killers. Justin Sneed was reportedly to be known as a meth addict, and he had mooched his way through life ending up at the Best Budget Inn, where he lived rent-free so long as he provided maintenance support for the motel. He was hired by Richard, not Barry Van Trees. Richard Glossop was the manager of the motel. He also lived rent-free with no bills and received a steady income of about $1,300 a month for his services that he performed there. This is not including bonuses and income he got from vending machines he owned on the property. In 1996, that would have been considered a pretty good living. Now the witnesses. We won't be talking much about them. As I said before, we are only reviewing the interrogations, but their names will be mentioned. If you wish to read their trial testimonies, the links will be provided in the description box below. First, Billy Hooper. She was a front desk clerk who knew Barry Van Treese very well and worked with Richard and Justin on a daily basis. Now, Cliff Everhart. He was a personal friend of Barry Van Treese who worked security in exchange for a small cut of the motel chain's profit. Now the crime. On January 7, 1997, Barry Van Treese arrived at his motel to check on things, pay his employees, and to pick up the deposit. He was also staying the night before going back home. This was normal for him, so normal in fact that he had two specific rooms he would stay in, mainly 102 because it was the nicest room with a waterbed, a good TV, and a stereo, and he would also occasionally stay in room 108. Around 4 a.m., Justin Sneed used his maintenance keys to break into the room where Barry was sleeping. His intentions were to get Barry's keys because he wanted to steal the deposit money out of Barry's car. He had an aluminum baseball bat with him. At some point, Barry woke up. There was a struggle, and Justin was hit in the eye. Barry, sadly, was beaten to death with the bat. One of the windows to the room was broken at some point during the struggle. Then, Justin drove Barry's car to a bank parking lot not far from the motel. The next day, the bank found the car, and in it was receipts from the Best Budget Inn. So, security called the motel and informed Billy, the front desk girl, the car was there. It was eventually confirmed the car was Barry's, and at that point, she became worried. So, she called Donna, Barry's wife, and Cliff, the security guy. After a brief search of the motel done by Justin himself, Barry could not be found. It was then that the police were called. Police eventually found the body in room 102. Now that is the most factual representation of the crime, but now it starts to get muddy. And this is where we need to try and separate facts from fiction. 
At that point in time, Justin could not be found, and Richard was taken in for interrogation. Richard told investigators that Barry showed up around 6 p.m. and then had left again to go to Tulsa around 8 p.m. that same evening. He said that was the last time he saw Barry, but he had expected him to return that evening. He claimed that night he locked up the office and went to bed with his girlfriend. It wasn't until about 5 a.m. that he heard someone tapping outside the office door. Him and his girlfriend just ignored it, but it was persistent. So Richard got out of bed and found it was Justin with a pretty banged up eye. Richard asked Justin about the eye and Justin told him that he had fell in the shower and hit his eye on the soap dish. Then Justin told Richard that there were two drunk cowboys staying in room 102 and they got rowdy and they ended up breaking the window. But Justin ran them off. Richard told Justin to clean up the glass and to install plexiglass temporarily to avoid anybody getting hurt. Now this is a very confusing part of his questioning. First he indicated that he saw the broken window and instructed Justin on fixing it, and then later on, when telling the story again, investigators asked him directly if he went to go check out the window, and he responded with, no, Justin's my maintenance guy, why would I have a reason not to believe him? After that, Richard claimed he went back to bed. The following day, Richard said that he needed to gather supplies and run some errands because Barry had finally given him the go-ahead to start making renovations to some of the rooms. He called a carpet installer to schedule service, and then him and his girlfriend went to Walmart to purchase paint, air freshener, and window blinds. While they were at Walmart, he got an overhead page on the intercom system that he had an emergency call. It was Billy, the front desk girl. Richard stated that she told him Barry's car was found and that Barry was dead. This didn't make any sense to investigators because at that point in time, Barry was only just presumed to be missing and police were not yet involved. Now, as you can understand, the investigators started to become suspicious of Richard because of the inconsistencies of his stories. At one point, Richard even acknowledges that he's making mistakes and stated that it was only because he was running on about two hours sleep. One of the discrepancies investigators pointed out was the fact that he had stated the last time he saw Barry was at 8 p.m. that evening before he had left to go to Tulsa. But when officers were at the motel looking for Barry, Richard told them that he had seen Barry two other times after that. Investigators pointed that out to him two separate times, and Richard never directly responded to the facts. He only just kept pushing that they needed to find Justin. Now, Richard's second interrogation. As it turns out, Richard lied about a lot of things. In the second interrogation, he admitted that when Justin came to wake him to tell him about the broken window, Justin told Richard that he had killed Barry. Not only did Richard then instruct him to clean up the glass, but Richard also helped him install the plexiglass the next morning. So the entire time everyone was running around looking for Barry, Richard already knew he was dead and pretended to look for him as well. When investigators asked why he lied, he responded with the fact that he wished that he did tell the truth the first time, but he didn't because he was literally scared and he thought everything was pointing to him and he was just trying to protect himself. They found Justin and brought him in for his interrogation. Initially, Justin told investigators the night Barry died, Richard came to his room, woke him up about 3 a.m. to tell him that Barry was back at the motel and in his room, likely sleeping. Justin claims Richard told him to go to the room to get the keys to Barry's car because the deposit money was in his car. They would be able to steal the money and that they would split it between themselves. He said he entered the room and Barry woke up. Justin said his intentions were to just knock him out by hitting him with the bat, but unfortunately, even after Barry was on the floor and not moving anymore, Justin still hit him two or three more times. He said he assumed he was just knocked out, then he got the keys and went back to the office to get Richard. They then went to the car and got the money. 
a little less than four grand. They went into a different room and split it between themselves. At that point, they went back to room 102, where they cleaned up the glass and found out that Barry was dead. It was at that moment in the questioning that Justin blurted out that Richard actually hired him to kill Barry. When investigators asked why, he said Richard wanted to take over the motel himself, and with Barry out of the way, he could do whatever he wanted, in exchange for the deed, Richard would give him $7,000 that he suspected Barry had on him, and would also then pocket money from cash-paying customers and give Justin a portion of it. Justin then stated that they both fixed the plexiglass onto the window, and then Richard instructed him to move the car temporarily until the next day when they'd be able to get rid of it. It wasn't until after Justin made these statements that he had asked investigators what kind of possible convictions he would get for the crimes he had committed. They did inform him that with a murder charge, he could be looking at the death sentence. Justin said he should have figured that out. It was then that they informed him of the two other possibilities of life in prison with or without parole. The one statement that Justin said does not make sense to me. If he was hired to kill Barry, then why was it just his intention to knock him out when he entered the room? That does put doubt in my mind that this was not a murder for hire, but possibly could have been a robbery gone wrong. But does that even matter? A man was murdered. Justice needs to be served. It doesn't seem fair, though, that a man who actually did the murder gets life in prison, and the man who was obviously involved but has no physical evidence connecting him directly gets the death penalty. But as I said in the beginning, Richard had two trials, and in both the jury seen and heard all the evidence. The results were the same. I will point out that despite being offered a plea deal that would have reduced Richard's sentence to just life in prison, he still chooses to this day to claim his innocence. Richard was able to avoid execution three times. The fourth date has been set for September 22, 2022. He is out of appeals. But there is a team consisting of 30 attorneys who have done an independent investigation into the case. They recently announced that it is enough evidence to prove innocence. So what do you think? Who's telling the truth? Was Richard involved in everything or just the cleanup? If he wasn't involved, why did he attempt to cover it up? Was it a robbery gone wrong that was planned by both men? Or is Justin just trying to save himself by dragging Richard into it all? Comment, comment, comment. I really want to know what you think. If you haven't yet subscribed, please do so. I enjoy making these videos for you, but I need to know if you enjoy watching them. Until next time, my darlings, take care, stay safe, and thanks for listening.